Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week, the series that airs every single Monday to bring you up to speed with all the latest happenings from the world of spaceflight, starship development, and all other notable stories from the past seven days. And boy oh boy do we have a lot to discuss. From the once again ever-packed starship development updates, SpaceX's Crew-4 Dragon mission to the International Space Station, the James Webb Space Telescope achieves full alignment, and China successfully placed two SuperView satellites into orbit bit and much much more. We'll begin as always with Starship development and what a week it has been. A couple of weeks ago we saw the removal of the propellant loading attachment of the launch tower's quick disconnect arm as it's not compatible with the new generation of Starships. This piece is what interfaces with the Starship's upper stage quick disconnect panel, or just QD panel, supplying the vehicle with propellant and power and the claw assembly below offers stability while the rocket is on the launch pad. Ever since the connector piece was removed, the QD arm remained empty until last week when we finally saw the arrival of the new QD arm interface. Well, either that or this is the world's largest flat screen TV holder. <laughs> the plumbing looks largely the same here, though that's really where the similarities end. This part seems much larger, with the four arms extending much further from the center block compared with the previous connector's six smaller extensions. We can also see that the engineers are having quite a bit of fun again with the piping covers, with a happy and sad face over each. This is the duality of emotion that we were all destined to face on the 29th of April last week. This was the deadline for the FAA review period for the Starship Orbital Flight Test. Would there be yet another delay, or would the FAA finally grant SpaceX approval? Drum roll, please. Yes, it is delayed again. Matt, what are you doing? Are you okay? What's wrong? No, open the doors. I need to talk to you. Open the doors. No, where the FAA have pushed the deadline back by another month to the end of May, which is super frustrating and it's also starting to make us wonder how competent the FAA really are. Lest we forget the original deadline was December 2021. For the FAA to keep pushing this back by an arbitrary 30 days over and over and over again seems pretty senseless if they know it's going to take longer than this. Why not just delay by six months and give us all an actual realistic expectation? They did share this table, showing that the Endangered Species Consultation has been completed, which does at least put us a little bit closer to them finishing the review, but yes, super frustrating nonetheless. Anyway, how did I get to this topic again? Oh yes, the funny cover designs on the QD panel. Well, speaking of engineers having fun with cover designs, we also saw a Lego movie themed Raptor engine arriving at the Starbase site. Here we can see Benny's ever ecstatic exclamation of spaceship at the top of the engine. I can build a spaceship! As for the other Raptor 2 engines, Elon Musk shared this photograph on his newly acquired social media platform Twitter, inside of Starship Tent Number 1, showing a whole fleet of Raptor 2 engines. It's truly amazing how quickly SpaceX are able to pump these out. Unfortunately, we don't really get as good of an insight into their engine production compared to their booster production, for obvious reasons, but it's clear that they're starting to really nail down the steps to eventually mass-produce Raptor. SpaceX will need 39 of these engines to power the first orbital flight test, so we'll see a few more arriving at the site over the next month or so, I'm sure. Now check out how far along the Star Factory is coming. It was only last week that I was talking about just the first metal beams going up, and now it's already starting to take shape, which I guess is the beauty of modular building. Long term, the factory building will replace the iconic tents that SpaceX are currently using at Starbase, and we will see a similar facility constructed at their Starship factory at Cape Canaveral as well. SpaceX have been working on a mysterious steel structure at the Starbase site, and last week it was pretty much sealed up. At the moment, no one is really sure what this mystery box is. Do you have any ideas? Maybe it's a service elevator for the wide bay, or some sort of mass simulator? I legitimately have no idea what this is. At this point, I just want answers. Let me know in the comments down below if you've got any ideas. The biggest Starship story that I covered last week was the collapse of Booster 7's downcomer, which appeared to have imploded following a vacuum formation inside the tube. 
Early last week, we saw Booster 7 moved into the high bay, and honestly, I thought it would be curtains for this vehicle. But it looks like SpaceX are potentially going to try and perform a repair. We saw a new downcomer arrive at the site, and we saw lots of workers working on the internals of the booster where the crushed pipe was located. Unfortunately, we can't really say definitively if this is SpaceX making repairs, and this pipe is going to replace the damaged downcomer in Booster 7, but we can always hope. After all, if they can get Booster 7 repaired, then it potentially brings the date for an orbital flight test a little bit closer than if SpaceX were to just scrap it and move on to Booster 8. Zach Golden posted a YouTube video last week where he did a deep analysis on when the crush likely happened during the Booster 7 cryo test. Here is when he thinks the implosion took place. I gotta say, he's probably correct here. You can hear that definite bang and the sudden disturbance of the frost on the side of the booster. It really was an excellent analysis overall. Check out Zach's YouTube channel and his Twitter page for more Starship content. He's a really great source of information over at Starbase, and I'm a big supporter of what he does. I'm going to move on from talking about Booster 7 to Booster 1067, or just 1067, I guess. This was the Falcon 9 that, last week, launched the Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. This was the fourth NASA commercial crew operational flight, and it was the seventh overall crewed flight for the Dragon spacecraft. This rocket was launched on the 27th of April, carrying American astronauts Jessica Watkins, Robert Hines, and Chell Lindgren, as well as Italian astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. This mission, of course, comes very soon after SpaceX's previous crewed mission to the International Space Station, the Axiom-1 mission, which launched earlier this month, which is a seriously impressive crewed launch cadence. This was the fourth flight and landing for this particular Falcon 9 booster, having previously supported a Turksat launch and two other missions to the station, one crewed and one cargo. As for the Dragon, though, this was its maiden flight and was named Freedom by the crew, because in their words, it celebrates a fundamental human right and the industry and innovation that emanate from the unencumbered human spirit. The crew of the mission safely arrived at the space station after a cool 16-hour cruise, and the planned duration of their stay is around six months. As for the previously mentioned Axiom-1 mission, the crew splashed down to Earth five days later than planned. Originally, they were supposed to stay aboard the International Space Station for just 10 days, but due to poor weather conditions at the landing zone, this was stretched to 15 something I expect the private crew were probably quite happy about. <laughs> Outside of the space station, cosmonauts Oleg Artemyev and Denise Matviev conducted a spacewalk on the 28th of April, in which they continued to outfit the European robotic arm, which is attached to the Nayorka laboratory module. A few more future spacewalks will need to happen for continued work on the arm and to activate Nayorka's airlock for use on future spacewalks. SpaceX conducted a Starlink launch on Friday. This was Starlink Group 416, and as Starlink launches go, I guess that, on the surface, it seemed pretty standard game. The Falcon 9 took off from Cape Canaveral, carrying 53 Starlink satellites. The booster itself, B-1062, successfully landed 635 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship. However, this landing was a very special one, as its success meant a new record for SpaceX. This very booster previously flew less than a month ago. Just 21 days and 6 hours prior, it supported the Axiom-1 launch. This smashes Falcon 9's existing 27-day turnaround record, and really, I think it's worth considering the fact that these boosters take just over four days to travel the almost 700 kilometers from the landing zone back to the harbor again when discussing these turnaround records. That's almost a quarter of the time between these flights spent at sea. According to the webcast of this Starlink launch, the booster spent a mere nine days in refurbishment before being reflown again. Impressive stuff. I can't wait to see if SpaceX can narrow the turnaround window even more with future flights. What do you think? What's the limit of the time between launches? Anyway, over at Blue Origin, Tori Bruno tweeted that they're finally getting close to at long last finishing the first flight-ready BE-4 engines for United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur rocket. Here, you can see the combustion chamber and the nozzle sections. Hopefully, the rest of the engine is also approaching completion as well, and that they can finally be assembled into a full working engine, and we can finally see Vulcan finally fly. There looks like there's a slightly more complete engine in the background here, so hopefully this is all a good sign that things are going well. And speaking of Blue Origin projects, we have a new picture of Project Jarvis in the highest resolution and closest distance that we've seen so far. 
This was shared by Twitter user CygnusX112, and yes, it's not hard to see the Starship similarities. Jarvis will eventually be a reusable upper stage for the new Glenn rocket, which will still debut in its original planned configuration with an expendable upper stage and recovered first stage, basically like what Falcon 9 is right now. In this picture, there's a strange structure at the top. I'd guess this is either to allow a crane to lift the test tank, or it's similar to SpaceX's Can Crusher in that cables will attach to these pulleys here and pull downward to simulate the effects of Max-Q on the structure. What do you think though? That being said, with all the development updates we've seen this past week, we now have comparison images for how SpaceX's reusable upper stage development is going compared to Blue Origins, and how each company's next generation engine is doing as well. Uh, hopefully Blue Origin can catch up. Competition is always a good thing after all. Sierra Space shared this image on Saturday of Dream Chaser tenacity under construction. It's great to see this project pressing on, and I can't wait to see this thing fly. This ring at the rear isn't an engine by the way, this will be how the spacecraft couples to the service node, which is what docks to the space station. Initially, Dream Chaser will only be used for cargo missions, but hey, maybe one day we might see this thing carry humans as well, especially if Boeing continues to face delays with their Starliner spacecraft. And it looks like a mini space shuttle, what's not to love? <laughs> Over in China, we saw the launch of a Long March 2C, which deployed two SuperView NEO satellites into low Earth orbit. The SuperView NEO satellites are Earth observation satellites owned by Chinese company China Suwei Survey and Mapping Technology, who are a subsidiary of the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation. The satellites carry an imaging payload with a ground resolution of just half a meter. China also performed an ocean launch last week. On the 30th of April, they launched a Long March 11 from their sea-based platform in the Yellow Sea. The rocket carried five satellites and, according to official sources, they've entered their planned orbit and will provide richer remote sensing data and product services for users in forestry, agriculture, grassland, marine, resources, environment, urban construction and other industries. I do like watching ocean launches. I guess they just look a little bit more visually unique compared to ground launches. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, alignment of the James Webb Space Telescope is now complete. On Thursday, NASA confirmed that the telescope has been confirmed to be capable of capturing crisp, well-focused images with each of its four powerful onboard science instruments. Now that the telescope is fully aligned and ready for action, the team behind Webb is ready to move forward into the next and final phase of preparations known as Science Instrument Commissioning. This process will take about two months before scientific operations begin in the summer. Here are the test images taken by the telescope, and here you can see images of sharply focused stars in the field of view of each instrument. For this test, the telescope pointed towards a part of the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a small satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, providing a dense field of hundreds of thousands of stars across all of the James Webb sensors. I personally can't wait to see what amazing images come from the James Webb during the course of its operational life. It's not the only exciting ongoing NASA mission though, there's also the Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter. Last week, NASA shared some images from a recent survey of the helicopter, in which it looked at both the parachute that helped slow the Perseverance rover's descent down down to the surface and the cone-shaped back shell that protected it in deep space and during descent towards the Martian surface in February last year. Obviously, there was no need for any of these components themselves to survive the landing, so they just sort of fell to the ground and smashed apart upon impact, creating this debris field. But we can still go ahead and call this the first ever sighting of a crashed flying saucer on the surface of Mars captured by a local helicopter. <laughs> and speaking of helicopter captures, Rocket Lab's first recovery attempt mission has again been delayed due to ongoing suboptimal weather conditions, but they recently announced that they're now aiming for either today or tomorrow, that's May the 2nd or 3rd, for this mission. Here's hoping they pull it off. I would now like to thank all of my Patreon and channel members for helping make all of this content possible. I wouldn't be able to do any of this without your support, so I really do appreciate your contribution to this channel. If you'd like to sign up to either the membership program or the Patreon program, then do check out the links below and on screen. And hey, if those other two video suggestions look interesting to you, then make sure to check those out as well, after liking and subscribing, of course. Thank you all once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time. There's going to be a new Kerbal Space Program video on Saturday, so... <laughs>